Right, I shall make a start then. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Yes, I can hear this. Good, excellent. Um, hello everyone, uh, good evening all. Uh, thank you all for having me today. Um, my name is, e is EG. I'm a fleet support engineer from Circle Caledonian Sleeper. Uh, my presentation today is about my involvement testing, introduction and fleet engineering of CAF manufactured Mark V sleeper coaches. Uh, a quick introduction about myself. Um, I graduated from the Uni of Sheffield with a master degree in mechanical engineering in 2017, and then finished my two year graduate scheme with SNC Labeling Rail and Transit in Derby in 2019, and then worked there for another year before I joined Caledonian Sleeper as fleet support engineer in August 2020. So, what is this presentation about? Um, it's about my involvement in the Mark V sleeper coaches, which spans more than two thirds of my career in rail to date. And this includes the first two years of me working on the project as a graduate engineer from SNC, and the last six months as a fleet support engineer directly working for sleeper. So, where did it all start? It all started around mid 2018, I was joined in as an additional resource to help uh, a fellow graduate engineer at the time, drafting some operational procedures um, for a few months. And these were essentially less te technical version of um, CAF supplied manuals that train managers and crew follow to use um, various systems and equipments on board. Um, it was also the first time I've seen shoe polisher on the train, which was rather posh, I thought, at the time. Um, a few week, weeks later, I was moved on to the trial operations project. Um, this is where I spent the next couple months drafting testing procedures and risk assessments for testing and verification of um, over 130 engineering, safety, guest experience um, systems and processes, um, ranging from shoe polisher and coffee machine to um, safety critical systems such as ASDO and PASCOM. Um, this is also where I really got to learn and understand how the system should theoretically behave and interact with each other. Following the completion of the procedures and risk assessment, I then moved on to detailed planning of the daily testing activities for each day of the trial ops um, based on a combination of requirements on time, resource, path, operational scenario, and scope of each testing involved. And then compiled all the information together to produce the daily work package plan, which I then use for execution and coordination of the testings on board. And the results of, from all the testing were then compiled into daily reports to give my client at the time, Caledonian Sleeper, the evidence and confidence in the system behavior in readiness for fleet introduction. Um, after successful conclusion of the trial ops, I was then tasked to work on the degraded mode testing. Um, this is where I got to learn, predict, and verify the functions and communications between um, safety critical systems such as TCMS, ASDO, PIS, CCTV, and PA, um, so that informed decision can be made by Caledonian Sleeper on whether services can be run in any of the above degraded mode, how crew should react to um, minimize the operational impact. Um, in addition to trial ops and degraded mode testing, I also went on to plan, coordinate, and execute the full route testing. This is where I got to learn, understand um, how ASDO and PIS uh, software interprets the database, and also the fail safe logic behind the software design. I then uses um, these knowledge to develop the procedures to verify the station detection, the automatic door enabling, and the passenger announcement and infographics are behaving exactly as they should um, at the rules and stations operated by Caledonian Sleeper. After the series of testing mentioned earlier, the fleet was formally introduced in April 2019, and then I spent the first couple of weeks tech riding the service trains. And this is where I provided technical support to the, to the onboard train managers and crew 
and also pass on my knowledge and practical tips and tricks to future tech writers before I stepped away from the front line and started working on the development of Train Crew Fault Finding Guide. Um, this is where I apply, um, applied all the theoretical and practical knowledge I've accumulated about Mark V coaches and dived even deeper into the electrical and grammatical uh, schematics to produce a detailed and um, easy to follow fault finding guide on the four safety critical systems listed in the slides to help guide the train managers through the troubleshooting of alarms and failures in service. In summer 2020, I joined um, Circle Caledonian Sleeper officially as a fleet support engineer. Um, right after joining, I spent the first three months uh, at Wembley Intercity Depot as a depot coordinator. And I spent, uh, this is where I spent all day on the shop floor smashing my Fitbit targets, uh, learning and supporting depot production and communications, driving priority and improved fleet, fleet, ability, fleet availability in busy summer month, um, acting as a bridge between depot and CS engineering and operations team and also start building the construction, uh, constructive relationship with the local warranty and maintenance um, um, suppliers. After the depots of comment, I started my fleet support engineering uh, engineer role officially in September 2020 and was put on the duty engineering roster pretty much as soon as I started. And as a duty engineer, I was uh, responsible for the daily processing review and prioritization of overnight defects, and also acting as the daytime single point of contact for service affecting engineering inquiries from our depot and outstations. Um, this was a fantastic development opportunity for me as it allowed me to apply all the knowledge I've had um, in an operational environment and the exposure to operational decision-making was something that I never had before. In addition to duty engineering responsibility, I also took on various projects and uh, investigations. Um, in terms of projects, I've used my knowledge on 3D printing to design 3D print and trial fit um, flexible TPU end cover, as shown in the slides, um, to temporarily protect exposed sharp edges for both mobile phone holder. I've also developed a defect management tool, which I'll go into detail in later slides. Um, in terms of investigations, I'm currently leading um, technical investigations into some of the high profile system issues such as HVAC heating on the performance and TCMS and PIS communication issues where I got to utilize a combination of tech rider monitoring, onboard proof survey, system log downloads, um, independent temperature logging and regular technical forum with CAF and OEMs for long-term technical solutions. My latest and arguably the most significant piece of work in terms of long-term business impact since I joined um, Caledonian Sleeper is the development of the uh, DFAT management tool. So the DFAT management tool um, replaces the previous um, duty engineering email, which as you can see on the slide, it's a, it's a is an email that a sleeper duty engineer sends daily to communicate prioritized defect to our depots and outstations. As you can probably tell, the text-based nature meant um, it is very labor intensive for the uh, duty engineer to update and maintain. It also makes tracking of history and repeat defects very difficult and efficient. Um, the defect management tool that I developed makes the defect management process much more streamlined and efficient. Um, it uses uh, VBA macro to combine coach location data, open and close defect reports, and duty engineer review uh, defect review input to automatically generate color coded room availability for the whole fleet based on the location, um, service affecting defect report for all five depots and outstations and individual depot uh, defect report that contains all the open defects on all the coaches at um, every single depot position in order in the order of priority. So 
what have I learned? Well, the first thing I've learned is fake it till you make it. And I don't mean it in an unethical way. Um, to me, it's about willing, willing to learn and take on things that is unfamiliar to you, but you might turn out to be really good at it and really enjoy um, exploring your career in that direction. Expect to make mistakes and learn. And to me, there's no better time than early career to be making mistakes. And that's exactly where the most memorable learnings came from. And be passionate about what you do. And to me, passion is what keeps me pushing for changes at times when it just felt too much resistant to bother. And trust me, people hate changes. And last but not least, um, be constructive and willing to help and listen. Um, without all the help and support from my ex-colleagues from SNC and the opportunities and trust from Circle Calendar and Sleeper, Sleeper, I won't be where I am today. And this is the very reason why I love the rail industry, because it is such a close-knit community, regardless of which side of the fence you work for. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all very much for listening. So, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, for my presentation, I'm going to be talking about the Bealhack Snowplow. I'm also going to introduce um, what I'm currently enrolled in, which is a graduate apprenticeship. So, let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm currently enrolled in my second year uh, in the Design and Manufacturing Engineering uh, degree at the University of Strathclyde. Alongside that, I'm employed as a graduate apprentice design engineer at Broad Engineering. So, obviously, the graduate apprenticeship scheme is relatively new in Scotland, so I'll go on to uh, introduce that um, in the later slides. You're forgiven if you don't know what it is, or hopefully, hopefully at the end of the presentation you will have a good idea. So obviously I'm getting the blend of both the traditional degree, the theoretical knowledge that you get from a traditional degree, and I'm getting the practical hands-on knowledge that you would get. Uh, yeah, I get at Brody Engineering, you know, a, a real, ref a well-renowned real refurbishment uh, operator in Scotland. So let me just go on to introduce what a graduate apprenticeship scheme is. So in my case, I'm enrolled in a full-time honours degree um, at the University of Strathclyde, like I said. It's a blend of in electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And alongside this, I'm gaining the experience on the job um, that you know you gain from a traditional apprenticeship. So you're basically combining both of them. Um, this meant for me, I can apply my learning from, let's say, a lecture or a tutorial straight away into exciting projects like you can see on the screen here. This is the 153 cycle units that we've recently done a uh, refurbishment on them and actually overhauled them and turned them into cycle trains. Um, you can see that on the Brodie's website or on the LinkedIn page. So to be involved in something that's um, so interesting you know you don't you don't see that every day a cycle unit getting completely changed up and obviously you might get that in a traditional you might get design projects in a traditional degree but to be actually fully engrossed in the whole design process all the way to the manufacturing and then hopefully i'll be able to see it uh, going to service I'll talk to the scott real guys about that <laughs> um so the project i'm actually going to be talking about is the Beale Hack snowplow and you can see them on the screen here uh, they are what the function of them is what the name suggests. They plow the snow off the rails when we are being subject to heavy snowfall here in Scotland or in the UK, which in Scotland is more often than not in the winter, to be fair. Let's talk about the history of these snow plows. Um, like I said, the, the snow plow itself was initially mounted at the top front of a locomotive for the network rail fleet. But the, this doesn't really work because there's a various design issues with it. So, as you can imagine, adding it, uh, heavy snowplow at the front of a local, it sort of puts out the calculations that they use for the braking distances, especially from corners, you know, these are very in-depth calculations and adding that extra weight didn't really work. So uh, what they came up with was there was class 40 and class 45 bogies. Um, recently, the class 40 and class 45 had gone out of service. So they just used these bogies, attached the um, snowplow uh, onto these bogies and with the addition of a ballast to provide extra weight, that's what they have now, and that's what that's what is currently in service. So, a particular problem we had with this project was the source sourcing of the piston seals. So, um, I don't know if you can see at the bottom right here. This is the brake system where the piston seals reside, 
And within this brake system, this is a brake cylinder assembly and the brake caliper is uh, assembled here. So the, the air supply comes in here and it pressurizes this and the cantilever pressurizes, moves along there and applies pressure onto the brake caliper, which then applies pressure onto the wheel, causing the um, vehicle to brake. So the, the piston seals actually reside here. So they're really pivotal in the operation of this um, braking system. And any failure of these seals would cause the braking system of the whole vehicle not to operate as designed. So it was really pivotal that when we were replacing these seals that we actually had, you know, um, any fault with them would not be acceptable since it's, it's obviously you can't have a, um, a faulty braking system when a train is in service. So for the braking system shown here, as I said, when the air is on, the, the pressure builds up here and it pushes that out and it goes on. So the air is on, the brakes are on, and the air is off, the brakes are off. So uh, the problems that we had with these seals was there was an inconsistent supply of the seals. There was a long lead time with the seals. So while procurement was dealing with that particular issue, we, as an engineering team, decided we'd inv investigate the possibility of um, reverse engineering the seals as an alternative. So we went out and obviously um, started this engineering change process. And you can see what we came up with for the illustration of the original OEM seals and the reverse engineered aftermarket seals. So upon appearances, the only real difference um, here, which is the original OEM seal and the aftermarket seal, is there's a larger contact surface between the seal and the brake cylinder. So we didn't really know if that would make a difference within its performance. So what we really had to do was to, we identified performance was going to be a risk if we were to use these seals. So we decided to test them. Um, so we used a standard test that we use for the SBT Glasgow subway uh, spring brake unit actuators as well. And this test consists of five to seven of a, um, bar of air pressure is applied to the brake cylinder and air pressure is measured at specific intervals. In this specific case, we used the, we tried to simulate the, the air pressure on this um, system. So that was seven bar. So the first reading is taken at 60 seconds. The second reading is taken at five minutes and the level difference uh, cannot be no greater than 0 0.05 bar. So you can see how both these seals performed. They performed exactly the same, 0 0.05 bar. They just made it, so that was encouraging. So um, we used a standard test just to make sure that these were, um, aftermarket seals, if they were used, would perform the, the, in the same way. So what have I learned through this engineering change process? Well, on a whole, as just through an engineering change process, I've never been involved in one before. And I, I learned how to identify the risks involved in such a technical and uh, safety critical part. So for example, we identified the performance would be a risk and we used a standard test um, and to measure the performance of the seals, and that's the way we mitigated that risk. Another risk that we identified was the um, sourcing of the seals. If we were to go ahead and do all the tests and say, right, these seals are good to go, and then we couldn't actually source them, and there was an inconsistent supply of the seals as we had with the originals, what was the point in doing that whole process to start off with? Upon this engineering changing process, um, being completed, it was sent to Network Rail for internal validation, uh, verification, sorry. And obviously with any project within the rail industry, um, you have to adhere to British standards, ISO and rail group standards, which is obviously pivotal in any, any project that you'd be completing at Broad Engineering. In the end, the decision was made not to pursue the reverse engineered sealed alternative as the original OEM seals became available. But um, this was a, a distance, this, this, that didn't disheart me at all. The amount of experience that I'd learned through this whole process was um, really, really good. And um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma, and this is my presentation on for the Future Rail Competition 2021 on the repair of 158709 Train Street. A little bit about who I am. Um, I am currently a fleet engineer at ScotRail. Um, I joined the railway in January 2019 through the ScotRail Graduate Scheme. I have been working at Shoes Depot, primarily with EMUs, but I've now moved to DMU land, working with the 170s and 158s. 
Something that's slightly unusual about me is I am a chemical engineer and I studied at Strathclyde University. I have been able to use my degree within my role, which has been really great. Um, and some past projects I've been involved in range from the 158 Enhancement Mod, which is installing CCTV, HVAC and LED onto the fleet. Also the 170 Cylinder Head Leak Investigation, which was trying to establish the root cause of a cylinder head leak on the 170 rafts. The DMU fuel contamination review, um, which was looking at microbial growth within the fuel and how we prevent that. And this included the purchase of a fuel polishing rig to clean out that contamination. And finally, a PAN1, which is a system we use in collaboration with Network Rail. And this is for the EMUs to monitor the pantograph health. So whilst that was some of my projects I've been involved in, the most significant for myself is the one I'm going to discuss, which um, is uh, one of our 158 fleet, 158709 struck a tree while on the main line at 8am on the 5th of July 2020 when travelling between Edinburgh and Dundee. The incident occurred between Cooper and Taybridge South where the leading car, the 37 car, was severely damaged. Thankfully, um, there was no major injury to the driver, it was only minor, but sadly, in a train versus tree scenario, the tree does not come out as the winner. Um, initial reports indicated that the damage was to the driver's windscreen, the gangway door and the bogey, um, with particular concern over the structural integrity of the unit um, being compromised, and this would mean um, quite a significant repair. The unit was moved to Inverness Depot to review the scale of the damage, and it was at this point that the fleet manager at Inverness advised this was one of the worst, if not the worst, tree strike unit he had ever seen which filled me with both dread, but yet determination to tackle the challenge of returning the unit to service. Unfortunately, due to COVID, I was unable to view the unit in person, but that didn't stop the post-incident recovery and the next steps from continuing. So the first stage was to contact the insurance company to notify them of the initial damage, um, in addition to all within the business, including the Rosco Porterbrook. So within Scotland, a number of areas within engineering had to be notified, such as fleet technical, attribution and the maintenance depots. The finance department also required notification as they could expect a breakdown of costs when signing off purchase orders or liaising with insurance company. So a lot within the business had to be notified of, of the incident. And the next stage in the process was um, the tendering the project out to the repairing, repair companies in order for them to bid for the project. This was a great learning opportunity as we needed to put it out to, for a brief, which in itself I had never done before. So creating the brief, I included a breakdown of the incident, the potential damage and what we would require of the repairer. As I said before, due to COVID, I was unable to view the unit in person, but thankfully those bidding for the project were able to visit Inverness Depot to survey the damage and ultimately provide as accurate a quote as they possibly could in, in order to repair the unit. In selecting the repairer, we received a number of bids for the repair. Um, it was at this stage that I sought the expertise of Derek Caird, our heavy maintenance and warranty engineer at ScotRail, to advise me on what we as a company would be looking for. This ranged from material supply to time scale and of course cost. I learned at this stage that cheapest is not always best and often there is a need for expertise when it comes, but that often comes at a cost. If the structural integrity of the unit was compromised, it was important to choose a repairer who knew what they were doing to ensure a safe and quick repair. Ultimately, we chose Brody Engineering due to, the knowledge of, due to their knowledge of the 158 fleet. Brodies were able to move the unit from Inverness Depot, and so this was a great weight off my mind. The unit was moved in two separate stages, with each coach being moved independently due to the suspected damage of the bogies, it was unsafe to move the unit by rail. The unit was moved to Brodie's newly acquired depot in Kilmarnock, which I believe it was the first unit to be repaired at the new facility, which you can see being delivered there in those photos. So the repair of the unit started well, with the initial works beginning with a detailed examination of the unit, to understand if any additional works were required over and, over and above the first inspection. And this started with testing of the unit structure. 
Each coach was examined in detail by Brodies to cover every inch for any damage ranging from structural issues through to scratches in the paintwork. And there was great focus on the bogies and the wheel sets in particular, as with any unit involved in an incident. Ultimately, however, the repairs were confirmed to be the front end gangway door and coupler, the driver side windscreen, front end body, coach body, and under frame equipment, including the snow plough. One key point I learned from the beginning of the repair was ordering of material. Arranging purchase and delivery of parts well in advance was vital as lead times for material can be extremely lengthy um, and it was both a blessing and a curse that the unit was not as severely damaged as although the repair would, would be more simple, long lead times could have prevented the unit from returning to service. So that is why we ordered parts as soon as we knew we required them. Although the damage wasn't severe, specialist repairs were indeed required. Non-destructive testing was completed on the unit to ensure the structure was not compromised, with particular focus um, on the sole bars and the welds. Thankfully, all testing confirmed the structure was sound. GRP repair, glass reinforced plastic repair, was also undertaken to the front end of the 57 vehicle. The easiest way I would describe this is a bit like paper mache type of repair, where glass reinforced plastic is placed or used as a panelling through building layer upon layer until the damage is no longer visible. I had to review Brodie's method statement, which both helped me understand the process, but also Brodie's being specialised in this type of repair, I was confident it would be completed to a high standard, which can be seen as an example here or before and after of a previous 158 that Brodie's have repaired. The project itself involved weekly visits to Brodie's to monitor the progress of the, of the repair and enjoy a Kilmarnock Kelly pie, of course, which was great. This in itself had its own challenges as COVID was at its peak and work still had to continue. Precautions were undertaken when visiting the depot, such as temperature checking, but this was a demanding time, both adapting to COVID and my first repair, but I gained many, many skills from this experience. Reflecting on the project, um, I would say the greatest success was returning the unit in a safe and serviceable condition four weeks earlier than expected. This was in part due to the scale of the damage not being as severe as previously thought, and secondly, due to the expertise of road engineering. Additionally, the repair um, budget was maintained throughout the project, which is always a good sign. However, to improve the overall project, um, I would aim to expand my knowledge of the fleet involved. I was relying on others um, within Scotrail and Brodies to advise me on certain aspects of the repair of the 158 that I myself would like to have known, but I suppose this just comes with time. Additionally, the repair of the unit could not be fully completed due to the door suppliers, they themselves impacted by COVID, were unable to supply replacement leaf doors which were damaged during the incident. However, I liaised with Brodies and established a workaround where the leaf doors were examined in detail to understand the extent of the damage. The doors experienced only cosmetic damage, thankfully, and therefore they could be repaired temporarily and safely used in service while we waited for new doors to become available. I like to see a project or task come full circle, and in this scenario, it wasn't possible. So there was definitely a learning curve for me at that time to find and be content with alternative scenarios. For key lessons learned in the project, um, I would say, should another unit become damaged out on the main line? Let's hope not. Um, I'd like to be involved with the depot when final fitness to run checks are being completed, both to expand my knowledge and see a completed project make its first run, hopefully smoothly, whilst out in service. Similarly, collating all the documentation I now understand is key throughout the project. Updating documentation regularly, making note of any changes, no matter how small, is essential to capture the whole project and to keep it simple. So if another person picks up the project pack, pack the repair is detailed and well explained. This being my first repair was daunting, but quite a success, if I do say so myself. And with the unit back in service, I'm happy to say I helped to get it there. So thank you all for listening. Any questions? Hello everyone. Um, my name's Robert Cook. 
I'm an electrical engineer with SNC Lavalin, uh, specifically within the electrical team, uh, specialising in rolling stock. Uh, I went to Glasgow Caledonian University, where I studied electrical power engineering um, and had a year in industry with Scott Rail uh, back in 2016. I joined SNC Lavalin in 2017 and I left the graduate scheme in 2019. Uh, since then, I've been heavily involved with the electrical um, system of the Norbrems Wheel Slide Protection System, or WSP, uh, specifically a design integration and installation project for the Class 15Xs. Um, I provided on-site and remote technical support uh, to ensure the project continues to be delivered on time. Uh, I've also been providing design support where the modification to the core design is required in order to interface with variants of the Class 15Xs. Um, so my role has very much been to maintain a good working knowledge of the Class 15X WSP system um, and in the following presentation I'll to display some of that. So to give you a bit of a background uh, on this, there has been three main parties involved in this modification port project. SNC, Laval and Atkins who have been providing the design integration and installation management, nor Brems, who provided the actual WSP system, um, software and associated components, uh, Porterbrook, who have really fueled this project and committed to leading the first crucial WSP innovation, providing project funding and support for various fleet rollouts. Uh, together, this project has really helped the industry reduce costs and wheel lathing, its increased driver performance and the effective in-service life, uh, life cycle of these older 15X units. So over the last three years, the three parties have successfully integrated the design uh, of the WSP system on 162 units, 279 vehicles across three different classes of 15Xs, including 150, uh, one fit class 150 variants. Um, following the fitment to Northern Rail, which is the most recent, the class 150s and 156s, um, the design integration and uh, installation project will have completed 288 units and 533 vehicles. So um, we've been introduced this for multiple talks, including Scott Rail, Great Western Rail, East Midlands Railway, Transport for Wales, Greater Anglia, West Midlands Rail, as mentioned most recently with Northern. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of, uh, of the WSP system from an electrical systems perspective. I'll be using the 156 installation as an example. Much of the physical layout is similar with the rest of the 15Xs, but there are some differences. So what is wheel slide protection, I ask? Uh, you ask, the main principle of WSP is to prevent wheel wear or wheel flats, like this lovely picture here. And this is a result of wheel sliding uh, during braking. It's therefore reduces the amount of downtime the vehicles require for wheel lathing. Uh, most typically this will occur during leaf fall season when leaves on the tracks turn to mulch and the brake adhesion is lowered causing the train to slide. Uh, not to be confused with wheel spin or slip which is when, a, when you're applying tractive effort when the wheel adhesion is low leading the wheels to be spinning on the spot. Um, this, is a new, this new system will cover both functions slip and slide using existing wheel spin interfaces left by the slip slide detection unit in the case of the, uh, the class 156. It's primarily an enhancement of the slide protection function. Okay. So this is an uh, illustrated overview of the WSP system um, the, to be installed in the one class 156s. Um, there's a, I'll get the pointer out. Uh -huh. So uh, the, this is the WSP rack. Uh, located always in, in the one in the number two end. In the case of the 156, it's the engine control cupboard. This is supplied via the WSP uh, dual circuit breaker, which is located in the engine in the in the cab, and goes through the VR12 filter supply, which protects against surges and transients. Each of the axles has a speed sensor and an associated blow down valve and pressure sensor. There's also a low brake supply reservoir. A pressure switch and brake cylinder pressure sensor per vehicle. All of these individual components work together to reduce the rate of deacceleration of the wheels while braking, as this is often an indicator of slide. Um, this will not have an impact on driver performance, it will actually reduce braking distances. It's an enhancement of the system which is currently in place with the slip slide detection unit. Slide protection activates during braking um, as a result of the brake cylinder pressure sensor, which will detect the change in pressure associated with brake application. The WSP system then senses the slides by using these new speed sensors mounted on each of the axles, 
only one per powered axle, as these are linked via mechanical transmission. Uh, each of the axles operates independently of each other, and there are two methods of slide detection, um, so one during, uh, when it, during braking, one when it sensed that there's an excessive speed relaxation of the wheels, or two when there is a speed difference between the axles. Uh, speed signals are then fed to the WSB control unit or rack, which is then evaluates the speed of the wheels um, via, via main processing board. And it sends the signal to the blowdown valves to vent or hold air in order to control brake cylinder pressure and the level of brake application being applied while braking sort of frees up the wheel and allows it to regain some adhesion. So the blowdown valves are also controlled from the WSP unit when they can or can't vent air pressure so that the air system never becomes depleted as a result of WSP. This signal is supplied from your uh, low brake uh, supply reservoir switch, which will deactivate WSP when it's below 4.5 bars. Okay. So a little bit on the actual physical installation, but first the old schematic um, that we have. The top box there is the speed probes, these will be removed. The larger blue box is the SSDU, the sort of box of, box of tricks. Uh, that's going to be removed, um, but the existing interfaces that the slip slide detection unit had, where it would output um, spin, uh, outputs associated with sensing spin or sensing that the train is at low speed will be maintained as these have interfaces with other systems at the train, including the sander, the DSD and the fire circuit. And these are maintained um, with the new system. Here we have a schematic of the new WSB system. Highlighted in blue are their inputs to that system, such as the low BSR pressure switch, the pressure sensors for brake cylinder, and the blowdown valves. You have your dual battery supply from your starter and auxiliary, uh, your new axle mounted speed probes. Highlighted in red are your maintained connections and interfaces to the DSD, fire and sanding systems, uh, your blowdown valves and your WSB fault indicator test push button. In the middle you have your actual rack itself. Um, these dotted lines denote a particular card. There are four cards in total, electrical, uh, electronic cards in total within the rack. Each has its own function. Um, and here we have the actual actual picture of the SSDU. Uh, this will be removed. This is the engine control cupboard for the 156s. Uh, this will be removed and these existing relays that I mentioned earlier that interface with other systems through the 156 will be maintained and they'll just be shifted off to the right there to make way for oh, make way for this. The KBRS half 19 inch WSP rack installation. Uh, on the face of it, you have your power inlet. Uh, you have three rack connections, um, these are parting 54-way plugs, which interface each with an electronic card. You then have an alphanumeric LCD screen, which displays four-digit fault code based on the particular fault that you have. Uh, you then have your maintenance port, which you can plug a laptop into and uh, do all sorts of magical things. Uh, you can see the history of faults, you can force uh, inputs and outputs on and off. Wonderful. Um, yeah, there are four test buttons, S1, which provides a further information on multiple faults in case it's been really bad. S2 provides a pre-programmed test function, which runs through testing of the blowdown valves and the speed of interfaces. S3 deletes your current error message and S4 provides you a low speed uh, relay test. So in the cab, you have a WSP and fault indicator that will be installed. This was assessed via human factors assessment and consultation with the drivers to uh, uh, determine if it was where the best position was. And it was, it was here in the case of the 156s, and I think with Scott Rail in particular. So uh, the also in the cab is your WSB MCB, a uh, good position in case um, it ever faults, easily recognizable by the driver and maintenance crew. Uh, and on the underframe, installations are done with uh, conduit harnesses, um, which are strapped to the underframe with nylon cable ties. Um, between, these will run between the number two end and the cab um, for interface with the uh, WSP fault light and the MCB, and also, as well as onto the bogey uh, for where the speed uh, sensors are located. 
we run the uh, underframe installation. Uh, all the existing probe and wiring for the SSDU is disconnected and both ends are capped off. Um, all of our harnesses are man pre manufactured flexible conduits, uh, terminated with fast ons. The underframe terminal boxes are replaced with new stainless steel connection boxes. Um, and the bogey bogey electrical harness is terminated with a connector. It's all very modular. It's it's able to be disconnected and reconnected if there's ever a fault with that particular harness. So it's quite flexible in that sense. It doesn't come off too easy though. Don't want to say that. Uh, a look at the bogey installation. Uh, as I said, your these are these are the new speed probes that are lo located on your axle ends, um, each on the unpowered axle, and only one on the powered axle. Um, None of there's no there's very little uh, alterations to the physical structure of the bogey. Uh, all connections are you are connected using existing holes and um, you know interface plates that are already there. Um, yeah. Bit of a closer look at the speed probe installation. It's quite interesting. It's a electro-resistive sensor. Uh, which uses the dips and peaks and the toothed wheel to provide a one or a zero. And based on the frequency of those ones or zeros, um, you can then determine the speed of your wheel. And that's me. Well, everyone, uh, I don't think I've been at one of our events when we've had five presentations in one evening. So uh, I, I hope five is not too many and, and that you find this of interest. Uh, this was a presentation that I gave to a, an IMACI conference. I was asked to speak about hydrogen but I decided to rather than talk about trains uh, look at the whole transport sector because I think one of the things about hydrogen is that it has to be seen in a total context uh, and so this is what my, my wee presentation is about. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm lucky enough to have been writing for Real Engineer magazine and that's sent me to various places and it's given me a couple of interesting experiences as far as hydrogen is concerned. Uh, I first came across hydrogen trains in, in fact, uh, 2012. Uh, that is the UK's first hydrogen train at the Amakees Railway Challenge. And if you told me then, five years later, that I'd be travelling inside a full-size passenger hydrogen train, I would have not believed you, uh, but sure it was. And five years later, I was lucky enough to be on a, uh, a trip that Alstom organized to the Sals, their Salskitter plant, uh, just to commemorate the contracts being signed for the world's first hydrogen train. And that is quite an impressive development of technology. And it's all down to this, hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, uh, Hydrogen fuel cells are a very elegant thing. There's no moving parts. There's no pistons or connecting rods th thrashing around all over the place. You just mix hydrogen with air. Uh, and if you've got a suitable electrolyte in the, uh, in the fuel cell, it acts as a catalyst and the output is electricity, heat and water. So it's all very simple. Uh, I don't know how it works. Uh, I'm sure Emma can tell us afterwards uh, how it works perhaps. Uh, but one in interesting thing to point out is how they how they developed to the early part of the century there. Uh, power's gone up, efficiency's gone up, and the weight and volume has dramatically come down, which actually makes them practical as a mature transport technology. So that's my first introduction to hydrogen. But let's step back a bit and look at maybe the big picture here. Uh, the UK government is legally committed to achieving net zero by 2050. Uh, and the legislation that relates to that starts off from a benchmark that goes back to 1990. And since then, the UK has not done too badly. There's been some quite significant reductions, particularly in the power sector, as you can see from that graph. But transport certainly is the bad boy. Uh, and it's particularly bad because uh, one of the things that I find quite interesting when I search the statistics is that as of 2018, the uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy stopped reporting international emissions. This chart here does show international emissions, international air and, and marine shipping. So transport is the biggest slice of the pie and you can see it's not going up. And getting that to zero carbon is a huge challenge. And the reason it's a huge challenge is that if we look at 
the way the UK uses its energy, uh, all the various stuff that we've got coming in and uh, our consumption at the other end, uh, we have, we produce uh, 350 terawatt hours of electricity uh, and that compares with the petroleum used for transport of 640 terawatt hours, nearly twice as much. And what we're basically saying to decarbonize is that we don't want to use petroleum anymore uh, and it's all going to be done by electricity, which is a huge challenge, especially as petroleum uh, is so easy to carry around and, and stores an awful lot of energy. So if we look a bit to the future and see maybe the 2050 equivalent of that, this is a projection of the national grid, uh, which is pretty much almost an all electric future, but with some hydrogen, and you can see the use of the hydrogen shown there, and some biofuels, uh, which certainly aviation aspires to. But the point about biofuels, and this was in the Committee of Climate Change's Net Zero report, biofuels are very much a finite resource. There's a limited amount of land, uh, and there's various things you've got to do to make biofuels genuinely net zero. It's an exceedingly limited resource and so therefore biofuels are only really feasible for the sort of things that there's no other alternative of which aviation is perhaps one. Quite interesting to compare the two, those two scenarios in terms of uh, the energy figures there and you can see in 2050 it shows a lot less energy being used twice as much electricity, uh, more than twice as much, but one of the reasons for that is electrical power is much more efficient. Uh, the old second law of th thermodynamics kicks in if we're using petroleum. Uh, so an interesting comparison between those two. So the main problem essentially we've got is that if we're going to eliminate petroleum, with the exception of a small limited amount of biofuels, the only other large scale option we've got to transport energy large quantities of is electricity. Uh, but electricity can only be transmitted to fixed locations. And in practical terms, it, it cannot be stored. It needs to be converted into another type of energy for storage. Uh, and the only two options really in practical terms are chemical energy and batteries are usually electricity to produce hydrogen and you always lose energy in such conversions. And frankly, nothing comes close to storing the amount of energy we've got in petroleum. And this illustrates uh, the scale of the challenge. If we talk about volume, looking at interior space there, uh, the figures are times diesel. Uh, and just to show how, if you want to store the same energy against the interior space of a railway coach, uh, and you can see hydrogen stored at 350 bar, which is generally where, where hydrogen stored, although there is an aspiration to do it at 700 bar, uh, takes up far more space. Batteries take up even more space, although it's reckoned by about 2035, it'll be down to maybe comparable with, with hydrogen, but, but those are just projections. And if we look at weight, uh, hydrogen weighs roughly the same as, as diesel, uh, but batteries have got huge weight penalties associated with them. Uh, so that's the problem we've got. On, for transport, we've got to store energy on board vehicles. There is, however, one exception, and the exception is electric trains. And electric trains, because they can suck up megawatts of power on the move, are essentially the only high powered zero carbon transport technology uh, as uh, Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government recognise, but unfortunately uh, that recognition isn't quite there south of the border yet. Uh, so that's essentially the situation with electric trains and network rails uh, decarbonisation network strategy concluded that for the remaining unelectrified network, that's roughly the mix of traction you need for rail decarbonisation. Uh, so railways are, are lucky in having a technology that actually works, but we still need some hydrogen. Let's consider hydrogen storage a little bit, just to essentially highlight the challenge and show what's involved. There's various ways of storing uh, hydrogen. Uh, the most practical way 
uh, on pretty much all transport is by by compressing it. Uh, you can do it at 700 bar, but that uses a lot more energy and it uses uh, more complex uh, and expensive kit. Uh, you're actually losing energy to actually compress the hydrogen. Uh, and it's, it's only for the same amount of energy, uh, as we said earlier, you, you need a, a, a lot more space. One option is liquid hydrogen, uh, as is used in space rockets. Liquid, liquid hydrogen is only 20 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, and it takes a lot of energy to, to liquefy it. You lose about 35% of the uh, energy in the hydrogen. But it actually uh, doesn't take up, it's, it's, doesn't take up as much space as compressed uh, hydrogen. Uh, ammonia is an interesting way of storing hydrogen and it's relatively transport, easily transportable. Uh, at 10 bar, uh, it's, it's a liquid. Uh, or conversely, if you can refrigerate it to minus 33 degrees C, uh, it's liquid at, uh, at one bar. Uh, obviously, it's poisonous. It's not good to have lots of ammonia on railway trains or cars or whatever. Uh, but it's got potential uh, because it could be used as directly to fuel existing diesel engines with appropriate catalysts and such like. Uh, there's other ways of, of storing hydrogen by combining it uh, chemically with uh, organic compounds or metal hydrides, uh, but those, again, use up a lot of energy. They also take a long time to release the hydrogen, so it's not really practical for fuels. So that, that kind of shows the challenges about using hydrogen, uh, but right now it is the only thing that is, will give you the range to actually uh, get a bit more high powered transport than batteries. And let's look at the efficiency of hydrogen, which is not that great. Uh, if we take uh, electricity generation and we uh, use it to uh, produce hydrogen, that's about 70% efficient. Uh, you've got to compress it, you've got the fuel cell, then you've got some sort of converter and drive. So you basically need three kilowatts to get one kilowatt at the wheel, which I guess is not that dissimilar from uh, a diesel engine. Uh, so, but the question is, is that a problem? Uh, it doesn't sound very good, 32% efficiency, but we can produce uh, our hydrogen from surplus overnight wind power. Uh, it's also the case that apparently renewable energy is constrained from lack of demand that hydrogen projects would produce. But the other thing about hydrogen is the price certainty because the cost of the fuel is the cost of the kit. If you've bought a turbine and a, uh, an electrolyzer plant, then you're basically servicing the capital cost of that and the maintenance cost so you know what the price will be. And here's an interesting thing. Alstom's uh, latest order for 27 hydrogen trains in Germany included the supply of hydrogen for 25 years. Now, we're all probably fairly familiar with rolling stock contracts that include maintenance for 25 years, but I've never seen one that included fuel for 25 years. Uh, and I guess price certainty uh, is, is quite important there, and I find that quite interesting. So the efficiency, whilst it's not ideal, is not necessarily a problem. If you look at uh, hydrogen on trains, there's uh, at the top there a picture of Alstom's Island that's got uh, its fuel tanks on the roof. Uh, as we know, we've got a much more constrained loading gauge. So storing hydrogen is a problem in the UK where there are currently uh, three proposed hydrogen trains uh, on the go. Uh, Rail's actually quite a small player in this. The Committee for uh, Climate Change looked at demand for hydrogen for transport. And as you can see there, trains 0.3 terawatt hours compared with the potential for HGVs of 22 and buses 3 terawatt hours. So rail is a bit player uh, and we have the opportunity to take on board all manner of synergies. Uh, but I suppose the point about rail is it's got a longer vehicle life than road vehicles. So it's important to make a start now. Uh, so that's rail. Let's move a bit beyond rail. Uh, let's look at on the road there. There's various projects for buses, uh, a very significant project 
uh, in Aberdeen, which we'll come to soon. Uh, London's now got hydrogen-powered double-decker buses. And Scotland seems to have a penchant for hydrogen-powered bin lorries. Uh, and in fact, the hydrogen train that's under development at Bowness right now uh, is actually using the uh, hydrogen powertrain that's also being used in Glasgow's bin lorries. So we have technology transfer from bin lorries there, uh, which is good to see the synergy of things. One thing that's quite interesting is HGVs. Uh, and the Committee for Climate Change commissioned Ricardo to do a really in-depth study to look at what the options were and what the costs and the issues were around those various options. And they considered five options for HGG, uh, pure hydrogen, pure battery, hydrogen with an electric road system, which is uh, uh, wiring up about 3, 000, nearly 4,000 kilometers of, of motorway, uh, and, and battery with a hydrogen range extender. And what they considered there was not just you know, the cost of the fuel, but the infrastructure that's involved. And that's, that's really quite important. Uh, the conclusion was that whilst battery HGVs would be cheaper in terms of the fuel cost, if you look at the total infrastructure costs associated with that lot, uh, and then you take out the whole life cycle, hydrogen may well be the cheaper option because it doesn't require the massive power upgrade that will be required to supply a fully uh, a full battery HGV solution. Uh, and I thought it was quite interesting. There's other issues around batteries as well. Batteries for HGVs are very heavy, so that obviously affects things like payload. Uh, but I mean, these are just indications of, of possibilities. One thing that is important is that once a solution for HGVs is derived at, it needs to be an international solution because obviously there's a lot of cross-border traffic and the infrastructure that supports it needs to be the same. So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, consideration of the future, but it does stress the importance of infrastructure. Let's look at ships. And on, on sea, ammonia would seem to be uh, one of the likely solutions. Uh, ships have got massive great diesel engines that people don't want to get rid of and ammonia can be built in those. Uh, in the fairly large machinery spaces of a, of a ship you could accommodate uh, ammonia uh, quite safely from, uh, uh, from, from passengers that generally aren't carried on certainly freight ships. Uh, it's easy to handle uh, and because it can be burnt directly in diesel engines uh, in the medium term you would do that maybe with a long-term move towards fuel cells. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. Let's look at what's happening in the air. And Airbus have got some quite interesting proposals to use liquid hydrogen. Uh, you can't store, you need a pretty good uh, vacuum flask to store liquid hydrogen, to put it mildly. Uh, it needs a, lot, a big cylindrical space. You can't store it in the wings as you would do with, with most fuel. Uh, and because you, you're sticking it at the back there, as you can see uh, with the one with the hy hybrid uh, turbofan engines, uh, it would reduce both passenger space and also change the trim of the aircraft as, you, as it burns fuel. Although hydrogen only weighs about 70%, liquid hydrogen has only got about 70% the weight of uh, petroleum. Uh, one of the things that they're, they're looking at is a blended wing configuration where you could put you could get hydrogen in the, in the wing routes there. Uh, but that's quite a serious project and they're putting a lot of work and money into that uh, and they consider it is technically feasible. Uh, and the idea of liquid hydrogen in the air, I find quite fascinating actually. So to conclude, uh, actually let's just talk about supplying hydrogen, sorry. How do we actually move hydrogen around the place is, is a good point. We could use pipelines, uh, which may require a significant amount of fixed infrastructure. You could use road tankers, but because of the energy density, uh, you would need 12 times the number of road uh, tankers as you do now, as you can see there. Uh, typically, one road tanker would supply 60 diesel rail cars, but only five hydrogen ones. 
But perhaps the best option, especially for what you could term as back-to-base operations, is electricity because hydrogen is, in effect, an energy vector. So why not transmit your electricity to where you're going to use it and then generate your hydrogen? And that's what was done at Aberdeen. Uh, that's the fueling plant that fueled Aberdeen's 10 hydrogen buses. Uh, and the pilot concluded that that was a mature, scalable and reliable technology. Uh, prices are likely to continue to increase as hydrogen uh, economy uh, develops and it also offers grid balancing opportunities uh, as we mentioned earlier you can generate it from uh, overnight wind power uh, there's the size of the thing it needed a one megawatt energy supply and it cost about 1.5 million so if you multiply the space the uh, the space the uh, electrical supply and the cost by 10 that's probably what you would need to f supply f for example 10 uh, a fleet of 10 hydrogen trains so to conclude uh, this is all about the future um, and it's about a good few years away yet what I find quite interesting when you follow these conversations on Twitter is how definitive people are about this whole thing there's, there's lots of unknowns and things to be resolved uh, but one thing is that hydrogen is very definitely needed if transport is to be weaned off petroleum in some way. Uh, <coughs> it's a much more flexible energy carrier than electricity. It's a small but, only part, uh, but important part of the solution. And that's especially true as far as railways are concerned. It needs a lot of investment in infrastructure. And one of the most powerful recommendations of the Committee for Climate Change report is that those savings need to be in incentivized in investment. Uh, and personally, I can't see things happening unless there is that incentive to invest in, in carbon saving infrastructure such as uh, hydrogen generation. And finally, <coughs> The suitability of hydrogen for many applications requires all sorts of considerations and of which engineering factors are a part, but not the only ones. And it's wrong just to consider just the only engineering issues. The, the synergy of the whole thing needs to be considered and the overall economics need to be considered. Uh, that's it. Uh, I hope you found that interesting.